All right, so we're here today at the Van Mark Farms. We're visiting with Lois Van Mark about uh, their no-till dryland winter wheat. So Lois, we're excited to hear about uh, some of your farming practices and what you've been doing over here that, that is maybe unique uh, to some of our other uh, dryland winter wheat producers. So how long have you been doing no-till? My dad actually has played with no-till and chemical tillage for maybe 40 years, but it was the early 2000s when we really decided that we had to do something because we had a problem with uh, it, feral rye in the wheat. And the old ways of using a spring crop to break the rotation seemed like a good idea, but it just didn't work because we also were having some really dry years. At that point then, we decided to look around and, and see what other options we had. Previously, we, had, we wouldn't have been able to raise sunflowers here. But around that time, there were varieties of sunflowers that were available, and we were able to raise those here in Wyoming and make money. There was also a sort of a movement. I think it was headed up by someone who worked at the Panhandle Co-op area, and he was really pushing no-till and multiple crops in a year. And so we started researching that just to see, could we do that? Could we make that work? So we talk about your production being in a no-till system, but you're also doing a summer fallow as yes. well, so um, how does that work? We worked with uh, several people, we did a lot of research, and we decided that no-till was the way for us. We were gonna try that. So what we did was we took all of our cropping lands and we divided it up into four crops. It was gonna be wheat, sunflowers, millet, and then a summer fallow. And we decided that we had to have a summer fallow preceding our wheat. When you break up the cycle, of whatever the crop is that you're growing, there are still weeds that you miss. And when you have a summer fallow year, you have that option to, that, where that's just setting idle. You can go in and focus on whatever that particular weed is. We have lots of little blowy hilltops here that we never could get anything established on because the soil is either non-existent or very thin there. By taking this no-till approach and you never turn the soil underneath, the residual of whatever the crop is, whether it's weeds or crop, it's all laying on the very top part of the uh, soil. And it has a better opportunity to break down. Here in this arid area of Wyoming, if you're plowing or even disking, if you turn that soil under, you turn it up the next year or two, it hasn't even degraded. It's still just yeah. as good as it was when you turned it under. So you don't have enough moisture in the soil to break it down? That's right. There's just not enough moisture. You don't have enough uh, biomatter, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So you found a better breakdown of that organic material, that residue, by leaving it on the surface. Those blowy knobs are not real productive, but they don't blow as bad mm -hmm. as they used to and I think we're actually getting something growing on there a little better. Um, it's gonna take us many, many years, of course, to build that up to where it's valuable. I have now gone back to a wheat fallow rotation. If I have a, a weed problem in a particular set of fields, I am using that as a sp the spring crop, uh, and the spring crop I'm using now is safflower. But since I can plant safflowers or sunflowers, as late as the first part of June, that really gives me a chance to target some of those problem weeds. But we have now found, after 15 years of doing the no-till, there are other weeds that start to invade yeah. in that you'd never thought of, and you never even saw. Mm -hmm. And one of them we're finding is Threon fescue. So we found that it's a simple way to deal with it. You, it cannot handle tillage. If you just go over that early, early spring, it's, you know, like maybe March, that stuff can't handle it and it won't grow back. Mm -hmm. I guess you could say I'm not 100% never tillage mm -hmm. because even under a no-till situation in this area in Wyoming, you've got to always be flexible and be willing to manage your cropping by changing something. You're talking about some of the changes you've made coming into a no-till system. You know, what kind of equipment changes have, has gone along with that? When you make the decision to go from tillage to no tillage, you do have to change not just your mindset, but you do have to change some machinery. That's where you've got to spend some money, and that's serious money. We're talking twelve to $1,500 per foot wide. 
there are lots of resources out there. That's not, to, I'm not trying to discourage anybody that way, but this is not something that you can do on a whim. In the summertime, I'm summer fallowing with a 90 foot boom sprayer because I'm killing the weeds with chemicals. I used to have three guys working for me, and now it's just me. No-till machinery is heavy. It has to be heavy in order for it to, you know, lay the seed in the ground. Because no matter what, you, you try to go in a different track, but your implements are all the same width, you know? Mm -hmm. So you end up going in the same place so many times, no matter how hard you work at that. We did go out and buy um, a no-till drill. It used to be that when we went out on our wheat fields, you could see the tracks where the tractor went every yeah. single time. You can't see that now. We're very close to the city of Torrington. We're within five miles. And when Torrington cleans out their sewer ponds, they bring the sludge out here to the farm and inject that. They're bringing, in a dry year, it's almost a third of an acre foot of water. In the acres where there is um, sludge, mm -hmm. next to an acre that hasn't had sludge, the wheat in, a, in any given year might be as six inches taller. So is that the only essentially fertilizer that you apply to your farmland then? That is the only fertilizer that we apply and we've tried doing various fertilizer approaches and we just never felt like the rain was timely enough mm -hmm. to really utilize it in a way that we could tell a difference. Have your input costs gone up or down um, with the no-till um, as you've made that transition and, and made some changes along the way? Regular tillage is about like $2 an acre, mm. and chemical tillage is 4 to $5 an acre. Mm -hmm. That's a big, big difference. In the beginning, it was a financial sacrifice. My dad and I said, okay, we've got nine different parcels where we're cropping. We listed them according to priority. Which one's going to sell first, second, third? I mean, it was that bad. Mm -hmm. We had to do that, and there were a lot of tears. But we find now that I've got the chemical process going and I've kind of got my weeds figured out and when I should go and spray. This year, I haven't spent that much money on chemicals. So what are some things that you wish you would have known, you know, 10 or 15 years ago or 20 years ago when you guys were really starting to look at this? I don't mind change. I just don't want to have any part of it, you know, because I am not big on change. I just, I don't like change. With farming now, and I don't think it's just no-till, I think it's with farming, agriculture in general, you gotta be willing to change. You gotta be out there researching and looking for answers, uh, looking at new options all the time, and then you gotta be willing to invest some time and effort into trying something that you think is gonna be beneficial to you. It's a costly venture. And you have to be willing to take the time and the effort to discipline yourself financially in order to invest in the chemical. But the next year, I guarantee you, you will have forgotten that because you've got nice clean fields and your combine doesn't have any trouble getting a perfectly good crop harvested. Are there certain resources that you look to to help you make some of those decisions? Um, are there, uh, what, what have you found to be beneficial? You know, I get all the email blogs and signed up to get newsletters from you name it, <laughs> just about everybody. And then I carry a shovel around in my car, and when I see a weed I don't know, I dig it up and I take it into the extension service and we talk about it. Or I take it to my local crop duster. So I rely a lot on the people in my community. With these changes you've made into a no-till system, um, have you noticed differences in the soil when you go out and, and dig a weed? Or The thing we saw first change in the soil was that it's more mellow. I think that would just was because, you know, you had all the residue from the previous crops were piling up there on top. So we're definitely holding things better. The thing that I keep my sights on is there's no feral rye out there in that field, or very little. Mm -hmm. Where I had, I had fields that were solid rye. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying I'm making the ground better, and I can see it happening. We're just constantly thinking we got to save the soil. Whatever we have to do in order to accomplish that is our main goal.